So we continue our Ephesians series, and I think probably one of the the great challenges, but incredible opportunities for a pastor doing a series like this is this really is uh, a message to the church, not just to the single members of the church, but to the body collectively. And, and, And it's a call to the members of the body to more fully appreciate, more greatly comprehend the immensity of the blessing that we have been given in Christ through the body of Christ in our culture, in our times, in our, in, our, in our normal nature, there are just a million reasons uh, that we have a difficult time comprehending the idea of blessing as a corporate thing. We, we really want to know what is relevant to us and maybe the few people that we're most intimately connected to, and that's okay Uh, But I think what God would say to us through this message is you've got to have a larger view of things. My very, very best for you comes through my very, very best for the church or the community of God's people of which I've included you. It's incredibly important that you're a part of the family and you relish your role, you relish your place in that family so that you might receive everything that I have for you. Probably Uh, Even though this is not a series aimed at individuals, there could be more personal or individual breakthroughs through comprehending what God is saying to us through this text than any other way. We are so self-centered and so self-sufficient seemingly and sometimes even self-righteous. But when we get into parts of scripture that really challenge us and show us that God didn't simply come to create individual believers, but a loving family to worship him, Uh, there's an incredible breakthrough to that. I don't think it's any accident that some of the greatest promises in all of Scripture are given to us in in the book of Ephesians. And and the reason the promises are so great, that they're so grand, is because these are promises not simply made to individuals. These are promises made to the body of Christ, the community of God's people, not simply the people who come together to church on a Sunday morning that come within the four walls and sit together in rows and do small groups together, absolutely including that, but the network of everyone we're connected to in Christ, husbands and wives, parents and children, brothers and sisters, business partners, people who work for people, people who have people working for them. Whatever relationship we have, if it's consecrated and connected and ordained by Christ, then that is the body of Christ, the community of God's people. And it's entirely possible that even the people that we're connected to who aren't in Christ yet are already reckoned before God as being a part of the body of Christ and his foreknowledge. There's, I don't think there's a single relationship or connection that we have with a single other person, the network of everybody we're connected to, that we should not presume has been ordained by God and has the capacity to be to us like the body of Christ. And that comes with these incredible promises Um, and these immense opportunities. I feel like what Paul has done so far is he has declared the greatness of who we are collectively and individually in Christ. And he has prayed, the prayer has been thus far that we would comprehend it, that we would truly comprehend who we are in Christ and what he has done for us. That we would comprehend who we are and what he's done for us and that we would comprehend the incredible potential that exists through our relationship with him, which leads us into a relationship with one another. In this particular chapter, we have been in in chapter two, he's even seemed to want us to, to be able to comprehend and, and, and gain the grand revelation um, of, of how far God came to even bring us into this community. In the first part of the chapter, he said, you were, you were dead in the transgressions and sins in which you used to live. But even when you were dead in these ways, physically alive but spiritually dead, God made you alive in Christ, completely out of his will, out of his intellect, out of his heart, out of his knowledge, out of his love, out of his sovereign plans, and out of, and, and out of us, not at all. We were far away, we were dead, we weren't even looking for salvation, and yet God brought salvation to us. He even wants us to comprehend uh, the immensity of that. And, and today, really, he builds upon that, and he wants us as Gentiles to begin to comprehend how far it is that God came to bring us into his spiritual family. 
The Jews were at least close. The Jews' God was the real God and the only God. The the Jews had the scriptures that were given to them through Moses and the prophets. The Jews had a real experience and a history with the real God in the wilderness and even across the Jordan and, and into the promised land. The Jews had the temple that at one point, the tabernacle, and then the temple that at one point truly had the presence of God. They may have not been all the way in the kingdom, but they were most certainly the closest to the kingdom. And and then Paul comes along today and he says to a, a Gentile audience to whom he is writing, which includes us, he says, you weren't even, that, you weren't even with them. You, you weren't even that close. He, he said to close the, the last section that we were saved by grace and through faith. And this one gift of grace and faith, one thing, two aspects of grace, you might say, it was not from yourself. It was all a gift of God, not by works, lest any man shall boast. And, and then he goes on to say this. It's as if the, the first word in the next verse is, is therefore, but really it should be furthermore. He says, therefore, or furthermore, you were dead, but God made you alive. Uh, you were saved by grace through faith and all of that was a gift. It didn't come from you. It entirely came out of the will of God. Furthermore, he said therefore, but I like furthermore. We'll go with my word. I hope I'm not changing scripture to the point where I get struck down right before you. If that ever happens, I'm really sorry. <laughs> I hope to see you in heaven. Furthermore, remember that formerly you, you who are Gentiles by birth were called or are called the uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision. So you were, you're the Gentiles and they were the Jews and circumcision was the grand sign that they belonged to God and uh, the lack of circumcision was the grand sign that you did not belong to God. Now Paul puts in parentheses here because he had a really great understanding of what circumcision really meant, what it really symbolized and the ultimate circumcision that would one day spiritually happen within our hearts and so he wrote, This little statement here, I I feel like there may be a level of sarcasm, though I don't know. He said, which is done uh, in the body by human hands. This This is only a sign of circumcision. This isn't the real circumcision that God is after. This is the circumcision that God prescribed, but not the ultimate one that it that it foreshadowed. Anyway, he's saying, remember that that you were far away and they were close. Uh, Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ. Now, Paul is an interesting guy. He was, a Jewish, uh, he was a Jewish religious leader before he met Christ, and then he became a Christian leader through his relationship and the calling he received from Christ. And so, in a sense, he was a Jewish apostle, but he ultimately became the apostle to the Gentiles who was Jewish. And he had a really difficult job because his job had to be to bridge the gaps or bridge the gap between the Jews and the Gentiles. And, and that may seem like a tough enough task to you, but go to the ancient East and, and deal with the, the, the history, the animosity, the hostility, the violence that existed between these two groups, the contempt that the Jewish people had for the Gentiles and the absolute resentment that Gentiles had for the Jews. And you know you got a tough task. To me, the best way for me to understand this, as I was reading this, I felt like the best way for me to understand it was to think about um, where I grew up in Georgia. And and if somebody came along and it was their job through Christ to reconcile um, the African Americans to to white Americans that lived in the South And, and, and to show them that neither of them were superior to either of them in Christ, that their, that their race, that their nationality was second to the fact that they were becoming one in the new nation or the government of God. And, and not only was God calling them to tolerate each other and to coexist among each other, he was calling them to love one another. And he wasn't even calling them to love one another. He was calling them to become one with one another. And, and that's what Paul had to do. But it was even more complicated because he had to come into the scene and he kind of had to say to one group, they're more right than you are. And then he had to say to the other group, even though you're more right than they are, or you were more right than they were, um, pretty soon here, even now, uh, they're about to be equal to you. 
You were the chosen people, they were the unchosen people. That's the way it was. You were the circumcised, they were the uncircumcised. That's the way it was. You were close to God, they were not close to God. That's the way it was. Your God was the true God. Uh, They had many gods that weren't gods and that's, you know, breaking one of the big 10 uh, commandments. Uh, That's the way it was. But now through Christ, for a mystery uh, that can only exist in the heart and the mind and the love and the will of God, he's made those who are far away, those uh, close with you, and he's brought them into the kingdom to be your brothers and sisters in the exact same way. So he had to let those who were close know that they were close. He had to let those who were far away know that they were far away, but then he had to let them both know that they were equal now. And, and that if the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, Jesus Christ, had not threaded the needle, none of them would be there anyway because whether you were near or far away, you weren't in yet. No one comes to the Father except through the Son and through the blood of the Son, through the cross, that we're all saved in the same way. Jew or Gentile, by grace, through faith, in God's word. And so he had this very difficult thing he had to do, which was to bring together the Jews and the Gentiles, also to de- explain the complexities of their spiritual history, and then to create an, an, an equality among them. Well, at this point in the passage, we're going to get into more of that as we go through the book, but at this point in the passage, he's just speaking to the Gentiles, and he wants them to marvel at the fact that they were ever included anyway. You were personally dead, and he made you alive. And you were among a nation of people and a type of people who were so far from God and weren't about to find God. I mean, at least the Jews, they could have, they could have fallen away from God. They could have bummed around their house. They could have gone to the attic. They could have found, I don't know, the book of Isaiah or some scriptures. They could have dusted it off. They could have read it. They could have heard what their family did and what they experienced and what God said. And they could have returned to the Lord. Uh, you and I, we could, we could fall away from God and go find a Bible in the back of our house and through the word of God and the knowledge of God, maybe find our way back to him again. Well, they didn't even have that. As a matter of fact, he goes on to say, uh, that, that you and I were excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise. We didn't have the word of God. We didn't have the promises of God. We, we didn't have the prophets in the Old Testament prophesying about the coming of the Messiah, which would lead to our salvation politically, economically, and of course, spiritually and eternally. We didn't have any of those promises. We didn't know what to do to please God. We didn't have the commands of God. We didn't have the capacity to believe them or to receive them. We didn't have any history with God where he had intervened on our behalf. We had nothing. We were without hope and without God in the world. And he's not saying this to beat them down. He's saying this to ultimately build them up. He wants them to be absolutely astonished that they've been included in, in, in the people of God. And, and as he desired that for them, I desire that for you today. I desire that for me today. Like, do not take for granted that you believe in Jesus Christ. You have been saved by grace through faith, which is a gift from God. If you have the capacity to believe it and to receive it, you have received a gift from God because the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing. You were dead and God made you alive. And not only that, you were Gentiles and you were nowhere close. Your ancestors did nothing to get you here. Well, yours did, but you know, way back they didn't. We were very, very far away from God. But now, by his grace, through his miraculous power, entirely out of his will, as I keep saying over and over again, out of his great love, uh, his great motive, which is love. But now in Christ Jesus, you and I, who were once far away, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And the gospel has come and the blood has been shed. We've been washed in the blood and we have now been filled with the Holy Spirit. The blood has ushered in the Holy Spirit and now we do have a circumcision, not the man-made kind, thank goodness, but the God-made kind, the spiritual kind, that is for men and for women, a circumcision of the heart. Before we were without hope, without God, We didn't understand the covenant. We didn't have the words. We didn't have the Bible. We didn't have the promises. We didn't have the spirit. But then the blood ushered in the spirit and by grace through faith, we have received it. We have a new circumcision, a circumcision of the heart where the dead flesh was cut away and a living spiritual heart exists in its place. And now we have the sensitivity to the Holy Spirit to hear the voice of God, to believe the voice of God, to respond to the voice of God, to obey the voice of God, and to receive the promises, the salvation, the riches of God's grace. 
And now look, he still hasn't asked us to do anything. He's just saying, he's just saying, comprehend it. Appreciate it. Marvel in it. And, and sit in this knowledge and saturate yourself in this knowledge because I'm going to give you some instructions on some things later, but this revelation, this information, this comprehension is absolutely essential for what's going to come next. You're going to respond to the grace that's been bestowed upon you in the form of this knowledge, which is, of course, collective, but also personal for every single member of the body of Christ. Uh, the Bible makes it very clear. We are, by nature, Jew or Gentile, we are by nature, naturally, enemies of God. Know it, don't know it, you are. I am. By nature, in my flesh, enemies of God. In Romans chapter eight, the apostle Paul says that, that, the, that the mind controlled by the flesh is absolutely hostile to God and absolutely incapable of, of submitting to God's voice or his word, absolutely incapable of receiving grace through faith, through God's, absolutely impossible. But the mind controlled by the spirit, uh, good news, everything is inverted, has the capacity to love God and not be an enemy of God by his grace, to hear his word, to submit to it, to respond to it, and to receive all the promises that are attached to it. He's saying naturally, you were enemies of God and naturally you were doomed to wrath. But supernaturally, you have been born again into the family of God. It goes on to say in verse 14, for he himself is our peace. That word peace is gonna reoccur many times between now and the end of the passage and we're gonna unpack that more fully in just a moment. But he himself is our peace. He is the peace we have between ourselves and him, and he is the peace that we uh, potentially can have with one another. He is our peace who has made the two groups one and destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Now, historically, what he was doing is he was reconciling Jews and Gentiles. That's what he was doing. But the, but the broader principle or the broader law that's also being presented is the reconciliation of all people. It's the reconciliation of the nations. It's the reconciliation uh, of the races. It's the reconciliation of the sexes, male and female. It's the reconciliation of Jews and Gentiles. It's the reconciliation uh, for those who are close to God and those who are far away. It's the reconciliation of a husband and a wife. It's the reconciliation of parents and children. It's the reconciliation of brothers and sisters. It's a reconciliation on a very personal level. It's a reconciliation on more of a global level. It's just a grand reconciliation whereby God has brought us peace with him and therefore given us peace with one another. It, it is very specific what God's uh, purpose is through Paul in this section, but we can go ahead and apply it as we go through the entire book and recognize this isn't what he's just doing between Jews and Gentiles. This is what he's doing among the nations. This is what he's doing among the races, and this is what he's doing interpersonally in our relationships within the body of Christ and beyond. The, the, the work of the cross is the work of reconciliation, and, and that's very much, well, entirely what Christ came to do. Now remember, the, the great theme of this book is, is the immensity of the potential that we have through unity. The title of the series, and I, I title these series before I really write them and then I always forget what the title is, but I remembered it today. The title of this series is Greater Than the Sum of the Parts. It, it, and the theme is of the book and the theme is of the series that if we come together in right relationship with God and therefore right relationship with one another, not just tolerating each other, but allowing the spirit of God, which is the peace of God to bind us together intimately to one another, then God can do something among us that is greater than the sum of the parts. He can take all of who I am physically and spiritually and materially and all of who you are and all, all of who all of us are and the network of all the people we're connected to uh, on the planet and he can take all of that and he can do the math and he says, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take that, I'm gonna bless it, I'm gonna exponentially multiply it and I'm gonna do as we will read in, in a later chapter, immeasurably more than all you ask or even think possible. But unity is the key. And an end to the hostilities is the key. And, and, and discrimination 
and prejudice and superiority and even inferiority and contempt and resentment on all the hostilities and all the things that come between us. That is the war. Uh, that is what will war with our ability to receive everything that God wants us to receive through this. And so it makes complete sense that all the vaulted promises of Ephesians come right along with uh, ministry that is all about relationships that exist between every single type of person that we're ever connected to. It goes on to say, if we read this in context, it says that, that, that Jesus himself is our peace, who made the two groups one, who makes two groups one, who makes two people one, has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. And by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations, his purpose was, the reason he did that was to create in himself one new humanity out of two, thus making peace. There's that word again. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which she put to death their hostility. When it says Jesus by setting aside in his flesh the law with his commands and regulations, the first thing you might say setting aside means to satisfy. The first thing he did was to become perfectly obedient. He kept the law and its commands. The second thing he did in perfecting his flesh and offering it on the cross is he offered it for our sins. And so he satisfied the law and its commands through obedience. And then he satisfied uh, the, the, the outcome of the law for those who are disobedient. In other words, he took our wrath. Those who by nature deserved wrath uh, no longer have wrath to look forward to. Instead have redemption, the fullness of God's riches to look forward to because he took that violence upon himself. He took that hostility upon himself. In, in other words, Jesus went to the cross and he settled all of our accounts. Whatever was owed to us was paid to us through the cross. Whatever was owed to others was paid to others through the cross. Whatever we owed to God, because he didn't owe us anything, was paid for through the cross. Now, as you've heard me say several times in this series, that redemption is much more than the forgiveness of sins. It's coming and forgiving our sins or paying our debts. That's the analogy we like to use. And then instead of just leaving us alone with a paid debt, it then brings us into the opulent family of God and blesses us eternally with the riches of God. And so Jesus purchased through his actions and through his obedience and through his sacrifice on the cross, he purchased for us peace with God and peace with one another. He didn't just purchase peace in the form of toleration or the ability to coexist. See, that's where we make a mistake. We think if we can just bite our tongue, then, you know, we become good disciples. Well, that might be the beginning, but that's not the end. We think just because, you know, we don't have those racist thoughts that get out of our mouth anymore that we've kept the law, but that's not at all what Jesus came to do. We think just because we can tolerate, we can coexist, we can walk along beside, we can restrain our evil desire to murder people sometimes or to give them a piece of our mind that maybe we've kept the law. We broke it yesterday, but we're finding it today. But really, he purchased something much more exceptional than that. He purchased this peace, which is his spirit, which binds us. He didn't just give us the ability to coexist or tolerate. He has given us the ability that we're trying to work out in time. He's given us the ability for oneness, for intimacy, for unity, for true unity, to be in relationship with one another, to serve one another uh, with the love and, and the servant heart of Christ. Jesus said, what did he say? Love one another as I've loved you. Serve and, and give, submit to one another as we'll read later out of reverence for Christ. He's given us this capacity for relationship that is beyond our comprehension and he's done it because he took the wrath, the hostility, the enmity that exists between us naturally. He's taken it upon himself. Now, the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. This is the spiritual reality and an absolute possibility, but it's something that is working itself out in time and not something that we often experience. Paul, at this point, is not asking us to live according to that promise. He's asking us, at this point, simply to comprehend it, to believe that it's possible. To believe that it's possible. 
to begin to uh, allow our minds to be renewed by this new information that battles with the old information and begin to believe that it's possible and to have a, a regenerated mind that will ultimately, we hope, fill up our heart and then ultimately overflow in our speech and then that our actions might eventually follow along. Now, again, this is very much about the Jews and the Gentiles, but you find me applying it to every relationship, especially our interpersonal relationships in the church. Um, but he goes back and he begins to talk about the Jews and the Gentiles again. But this is true for all of us. He said, he came and he preached peace. Jesus came and he preached peace to you who are far away, to the Gentiles. But guess what? He came and he preached that same peace to those who were near. For through him, Jew or Gentile, male or female, husband or wife, brother or sister, nation or other nation, whoever we are, for through him, we both, we all have access to the Father by one spirit. In other words, prior to now, their theology was much superior to yours. Matter of fact, they had one and you had not one at all. Prior to now, they were close and you were far away, but you were both on the outside. But now through Christ, we have equality. And no one is superior to anyone. Now within the church, we have offices, we have apostles, we have prophets, we have teachers, we have evangelists, right? In the world, we have bosses and we have employees. There's, there's authority and there's structure and there's order. And this book is gonna talk about all of that, but it's, but, but it's not about superiority. We're all equal, we're not the same. And it requires a, a special humility to offer, to, to exist in any relationship, whether you're up or you're down. But what Paul wants us to understand right away, right off the bat, though these guys were first and you were last, now you're becoming one. And, and, and they got in the same way you got in, whether you were late or whether you were early, you're one. They were saved by grace through faith in the words of the gospel, which is through faith in the belief of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross for the sins of the Jews and for the sins of the Gentiles, for the sins of the world. They believed it, they received it on a personal level, on a global level, and they, and they came into the kingdom of God the same way you came into the kingdom of God. And, and, and now through the blood of Jesus Christ, there, uh, there, there, is, there is no slave and there is no owner, there is no superior and there is no inferior. Uh, w- did you know, like, we're all Jews now? We're spiritual Israel. We're not very good Jews, but we're Jews. If you reconcile yourself as a nation, this is really provocative, isn't it? If you reconcile yourself as a nation, you're Israel, you're an American today. You have, let's say you have, you have two citizenships, American and Israel, maybe not in the geopolitical sense, but ultimately you're gonna have one citizenship and it's gonna be in spiritual Israel in the, in the coming kingdom of God. All other kingdoms, all other powers, all other authorities are gonna bow down. They're gonna submit and they're gonna vanish before Christ. It's gonna be him, his kingdom, his government that will ever increase beginning now, ending ever, never. And guess what? Good news for you. You are citizens. You are sons and daughters of that king. You're heirs and joint heirs in that kingdom. You, just like the Jews, have been brought in and you have not been brought into the kingdom of God, to the nation of Israel, to simply be servants or slaves or even foreign dignitaries. You've been brought right up to the top. You're a prince, you're a princess. You're an heir or a joint heir. You're, you're in the kingdom of God. Marvel at that. You who are far away have been brought near and many of us who are far away have passed some of the people who are near. And that should, as Paul teaches in another place, not, that should not create a superiority in us. We should just marvel at the grace of it all. How in the world did Brian James from Georgia become a Jew and, a, and, 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 and inherit all of the promises, all of the ancient promises etched into scripture thousands of years ago for God's chosen people? We, we think that Christianity originated out of America or Europe. No, man. It came out of the East, the Middle East. It came out of the Hebrew people. We were far away. If Paul had turned left instead of right, 
I'm not sure we're standing here, sitting here. We, we need to marvel at that. How did I get here? I was dead and he made me alive and I was among a people that did not know or acknowledge God and now he has made me the people of God and he's made me heir and joint heirs with my Jewish brothers and sisters. I'm, I'm in the kingdom. Consequently, you and I are no longer foreigners and strangers but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Well, if it's true for me, it's true for you. If I have that respect upon myself, then I have to have that respect Upon you, We're, and I tell you, you're not just somebody who goes to church here and, and, and sits down at a lower level than me uh, on the platform while I can, so I can speak down to you. Like, you're my brother, you're my sister. We're, we're in this together. We're, we're not the same, but we are most certainly equal. And I can't look down upon other nations and I can't look down even upon other religions because as far as I know, God's gonna do in them what he did in my pagan people. There is absolutely, consequently, he's saying, because we were saved in the same way, he's saying, consequently, to the Jews and to the Gentiles, one and, one and the same, there, there is now, therefore, no room for discrimination or prejudice in the church. None. Zero. There is absolutely no room for those who have been in Christ for a long time to look down and be superior to those who just came into Christ last week. Whether we were near or whether we were far away, regardless of our timing, I mean, there is a, such a thing as spiritual authority and order. We're gonna get into that, and that's a real thing, but it's not about superiority and inferiority. We're the same. There's no room for, pre there are no second-class citizens. It's just, not, it's just not scriptural. It's just not true. And Paul, he just wants you to marvel. He wants you to appreciate it. He wants you to apply it to yourself and begin to gain the capacity to apply it to one another and then begin to believe in the immensity of what he can do, the grandeur of what he can do through such relationships uh, where we exist as one in the family of God. You're no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens of God's people and members of his household, not slaves or servants, uh, but at one with God, the bride of Christ. You built on the foundation, got to remind you, the, Jew, the Jewish stuff is still real. Built on the foundation, uh, I'm going to add this, of the Jewish apostles uh, who preached from the Jewish prophets uh, uh, about the Jewish Messiah, Christ Jesus himself, as the chief cornerstone. And, and so, do you remember the scene where Jesus spoke to the Samaritan woman and she asked kind of the, the important religious question, do we, my people say we worship on this mountain, your people say we worship at the temple. And Jesus said, well, you guys worship what you don't know about and we worship what we do know about. And he validated temple worship, but then he said, but something is coming that's gonna change all of that because the time is coming and indeed has now come when all my people will worship me, not in this place or that place, but in spirit and in truth. But before he did that, he validated the other. Because the temple indeed was prescribed by God. It was the foreshadowing of what was to come. Here he's saying that, that the, he's saying that the foundation of the church, the foundation of our relationship with God and our relationship with one another is the word of God. And, and the prophets was, that refers to the Old Testament and the apostles are the Jewish leaders in the New Testament, the, the ones who saw the resurrection of Christ and were given this special designation through which they wrote the scripture, the 12 and a couple more. And, and he's basically saying the foundation is God's word. Those guys in, in the New Testament, the Jewish apostles, they preached from the Old Testament scriptures. Remember, they didn't have the New Testament. They were writing the New Testament. And he's saying our foundation is, is God through his word, not the men specifically who were the prophets or the men specifically who were the apostles, but God's word that came through the apostles that was preached in a more enhanced and spiritual way through the apostles. And their teaching, of course, ultimately became the New Testament. So it's the Old Testament, the New Testament, it's the Bible, it's the word of God. The word of God is your foundation. And the, and, and the Messiah himself, Christ Jesus, he's the cornerstone. And, and, and there's Lots of reasons that that's a, a perfect metaphor for what Christ is. In this particular analogy, he's the cornerstone that attaches the two walls, right? The Jewish wall and the Gentile wall become one through Christ. Uh, the wall between men and women become one through Christ. The, the, the walls of different nations that lived in hostility and as enemies one, to one another come together and find themselves uh, in their power as one through the cornerstone, through his Christ. And so, you know, it's Christ as the cornerstone and even Christ as the head, the capstone and Christ through his word 
even as the foundation. And then it goes on to say in him, which is another way of saying through him, through the Holy Spirit, the whole building, which is all the living stones that includes you and I, the human architecture, which is the church, not a specific building, but the network of all of God's people within the church, under the covering of the church building and beyond, in him, through him, globally, through time, through the rest of time, the whole building is joined together. And the whole building, by the way, is who gets to receive the promise that's spoken beyond this. Not just the individual stones, but in the, in the whole building, in him, the whole building is joined together and we rise to become a holy temple in the Lord. That's what the book's all about. The temple we become together, not the temples we are as individuals. And in him, you too, you and you, are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Do I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Am I personally filled with the spirit of God? Is my body now my temple because it houses the spirit of God? Yes, indeed, absolutely, personally true. But boy, that's typically where we stop it. Did you know that the greatest promises are not through the temple that is me and not through the temple that is you, but through the temple that is us? The body of Christ, the community of his people, or two or more are gathered in his name, there he always is, is what the Bible teaches us. And I don't see anywhere it makes that promise to an individual, as many individual promises as there may be and as may exist. We are collectively bestowed with a glory and a grandeur, an immensity, a power, a prestige, that we will never, ever have alone. This is so much more than, than the connections we have in this building, although these are vital and these are, these are sincere and these are to be esteemed and these are to be valued because the, the local body of Christ, those who come together for, to, to worship and to teach and to preach and to do life together, that is an immense power place. It's a hub of what we do, but it's so much bigger, right? What we're gonna read as we go through the rest of the book is it touches every single relationship. And the grandeur, the collective grandeur of that is something greater than the sum of the parts. It is immeasurably more than all we can ask or even think possible. Today, you may have came in here and you got your personal financial problems and you got your personal relationship problems. Welcome to the club. Every single person in here has that. You came in here today to receive your little individual piece of grace to go home and live your life a little bit better. But God's like, here's what I wanna do. I wanna blow the doors off that stuff. I wanna do more than that. I wanna do exceedingly more than that. But here's what you're gonna have to do. You're gonna have to seek first the kingdom of God, the family of God, the government of God, the temple of God, your relationships with one another. Not just your relationship with me that dispenses a little bit of grace in your life. If you do this and all these other things will be added unto you as well, you will be bestowed with a glory that is amazing. And, 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 and an amount of my spirit and, an, and a manifestation of my presence that will, will make its way to you in no other way. I'm gonna close with this. Sometimes uh, people come to me over 13 years, over and over and over again. This is a question I get, and it's a rhetorical question. What I mean by that is, I don't know what rhetorical question means, but I think it's a rhetorical question because it's one of those questions that they ask and they don't really care what my answer is because they already have the answer. They just wanna ask the question and then tell me what they think. So I don't know what that is. But anyway, they ask me a question where they know the answer and they think they know the answer better than I know the answer. And usually it's an accusation towards me. And so if you've done this, I want you to know that this is my passive aggressive way of getting back. It's called the bully pulpit. And they'll come to me and they'll say, pastor, why does our church, why does the church in general, but specifically, why does our church not see more power, not see more miracles, not see more manifestations of the Holy Spirit, not see more reconciliation and relationships, not see more physical healings, not see more financial breakthroughs, not see this, not see that, not have a greater local impact, not have a greater uh, global impact. And, 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 and they asked me, why, why, would, why did Jesus say the things you see me do, you'll be doing these things and even greater things? I haven't seen you do anything as cool as Jesus did, pastor. And I really haven't seen it happen very much in our church. We see glimpses of it, but we don't see it to the proportion that we think we should see it. And so they come to me and they ask this question and they always know the answer. And the answer is always this, we don't have enough faith. And, and, and often what they're trying to say is, pastor, you're our leader. You don't have enough faith. 
You don't set up environments where you expect God to work in that way. Therefore, God is not working in that way. Well, maybe that's true and maybe it's not true, but I don't think it's true. I don't think the issue is faith. I don't. I think faith is a gift of God's grace that comes through his word, that comes by the inspiration and the power of his Holy Spirit. I think even a little bit of faith is a very, very powerful thing. I think faith is incredibly important. There's no way to please God apart from faith, which is also a way of saying faithfulness. I think faith is incredibly important, but I don't think faith is the issue because I read the Bible and the Bible says that faith the size of a mustard seed will move a mountain. And don't tell me I don't have faith the size of a mustard seed. I quit my job to do this. I, did, I believed that God would so bless this that I would be able to raise four kids. And I'm telling you, that was lunacy <laughs> if it wasn't faith. It's not faith. I've prayed for people. I've seen them healed. I've, I've seen God move in many ways. I, I create environments as I feel led by the Holy Spirit to see him move. Sometimes I open the altar because I believe that people have the faith that, that God will move. It. I don't really think that the ultimate thing is faith. Maybe sometimes that is a factor. I give you that. Jesus did say in his own hometown that he couldn't do many miracles there because they didn't have faith. It is a factor, but I think our factor is not faith. Here's what I think our factor is, unity. Unity. Respect. Love, oneness, peace. And into the hostility. Not just willing to tolerate, not just willing to coexist, not just willing to sit next to each other for about an hour or so on Sunday, not just the willingness to show up from time to time, not just the willingness to go to the picnic because there's nothing better to do that way, not just the willingness to I mean, maybe bring up Christ in this relationship or that relationship out in the marketplace. It's unity, it's the oneness. I think in the proportion that we behold one another and become one with one another is to the portion that we will receive the promises of God. And I have very good scriptural proof for that because the entire book of Ephesians is not about faith, it's about unity. Faith is an aspect of that, but it's about unity. And I don't think it's all our fault. I think an aspect of or a major reason that we do not achieve the unity, therefore we do not achieve the power that is promised to us in scripture is because we have an enemy that prowls and he knows how to prey upon our flesh, which is still by nature hostile to God and hostile to one another. Great book out there called The Bait of Satan talking about offense and insult in the church and how it destroys churches. I would tell you to read it, but every time somebody reads it, the next thing I know, they're offended. So don't read it, but just take my word for it. And, and, and indeed, it seems for every action, there's an opposite reaction, right? Every time I begin to talk about unity, we fall into a season of disunity like I've never seen before. Every time one of us decides that we're going to extend grace and peace uh, in our marriage or, or in a relationship with a brother or sister or with somebody that we've had animosity towards, you can be absolutely sure that the enemy is gonna get involved in that equation. And the very next thing that's gonna happen when you hit that tennis ball over the net is it's gonna come back at 100 miles, miles an hour on fire, for every action, there's an opposite but not equal reaction, but the reaction feels more than, than equal. But if you endure, if you persevere, then you will break through, the enemy will flee, and you'll receive what God has promised to you. I, I can assure you that we will not go through the book of Ephesians without there being three wars in the church, but you know what? That's not the final word. That's just the next word. The final word is that we come together, that we find depth in our relationships that we've never found before. It doesn't mean that we're gonna be perfect. It just means that we're gonna grow and we're gonna mature and we're gonna unify and we're gonna have that, epit that light bulb like, I can't be a Christian by myself. I can't do it. I gotta be a Christian with my wife. I gotta be a Christian with my kids. I gotta decompartmentalize my life. I gotta be at one with my body. I gotta love those people. I gotta respect those people. I can't be a racist and expect the most from God. I can't be xenophobic and expect the greatest thing from God. I can't be hostile towards other people. I can't be superior. And by the way, I can't even be inferior. Having that false, uh, that false humility, which is just truly low self-esteem. We gotta work through these relationship issues because the immensity, the power, and the promises of the kingdom of God come through unity, true, deep, deep unity. Christ did not die on the cross to let us tolerate each other. He died on the cross to make us one. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your instruction today. And we thank you that you have prepared our hearts through this message for the messages to come. 
You are getting us ready for what comes next. I pray that we would indeed comprehend, that we would marvel at our inclusion, that we would just absolutely be lavish with the knowledge of the immensity that we have in you as a member of your community, as brothers and sisters connected to you through Christ. I believe that we, I pray that we would believe it. I pray that we would deeply comprehend it. It wouldn't just be information, it would be revelation. I believe that, uh, I pray that we, you would renew our hearts and, tran- and transform our minds, that you, would, that you would absolutely lavish us with this information, this knowledge, that we would, that we would fully appreciate what we have in you and what we have in one another. Come and begin to do this work upon the collective mind of your church, of Monterey Church, California and Virginia. Do this work in us. Unite us to you. Unite us to one another because we can't wait for you to keep the promise and do immeasurably more than all we ask or even think possible. We love you and we praise you. 